This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hey, Tanya. Hi, Talia. How are you? I'm doing okay. Well, we've had a rough month. We really have. We really have. But I'm ready to move past it. Me too. Let's do some true crime. That always makes me happy. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I know why. it's such the wrong what the word. Fu- I don't know. But what I, the hell is wrong with you? I'm fascinated. You sicko. I know. There's something wrong with me. You're so insensitive. <laughs> And on that note, should we start? Absolutely. Okay, this is about a serial killer. I got all of the information basically from a FOIA request from Oakland County. Oh. Freedom of information. I got police records, reports, confessions. So I know all about this rat bastard. (laughs) On that note, let's do it. Let's go. So it's August in 1991. And we're at Loon Lake in Wixom, Michigan. You know where Wixom is? Yes. I used to live there. A 38-year-old man was watching kids as they walked back and forth through a wooded shortcut to the water at Loon Lake. He hid in the vegetation, the trees, for over three hours, peering at them with his binoculars. He was hoping to spot a specific girl who he thought was about 16 and he thought was really hot. Ugh, what a creep. He's a perv. He's totally a perv. He'd seen her before, at least six or seven times riding her bike back and forth through the path to the lake. When it got to be about six o'clock, and this is a Sunday, the man figured that if the girl hadn't shown by then, she wasn't going to show at all. So he kind of gave up for the day. He started walking the bike path towards the area where he had parked his rusted old Dodge Airways. His car was just a beater. When he noticed a girl he'd never seen before riding her bike alone on the path. She wasn't the girl he was hoping for, but at that moment, she would do. He stepped in front of her on the wooded path and he pointed to the sky and he asked if she wanted to see a flying squirrel through his binoculars. The girl stopped her bike. She looked up and he grabbed her He put an open jackknife, which was attached to his waistband, put it to her throat and told her if she didn't do what he said, he was going to hurt her really bad. He forced her off her bike and towards this maintenance area near the lake where his beater car was parked. The car was riddled with empty beer and pop cans he had collected for gas money. Hanging from the interior molding were strips of duct tape that he had pre-cut specifically for the occasion. He grabbed a piece of tape. He placed it over the girl's mouth. Then he bound her wrists together with some zip ties that he'd purchased earlier. He shoved her into the passenger side floor and he put this filthy quilt over her and started the car. She was struggling to breathe under the quilt and she managed to rip the duct tape off of her mouth. A minute or two later, he pulled into this blighted field laced with large oak trees and he stopped the car. He didn't care that she'd ripped the tape off her mouth because he knew there was no one around to hear her screams. This man began conversing with his captive. She told him her name was Mary and I'm using a pseudonym. She was in fourth grade and she was nine years old. He told her his name was Leslie Williams, which was his real name. He'd never been with a prepubescent girl before. Those weren't what he was interested in. He wasn't a pedophile, but he was an aphebophile. Do you know what that is? I have never heard that word before. Aphebophiles, they like girls in puberty. Okay. Like from 14 to 18. Okay. But we always call them pedophiles and pervs. Same idea. Still a perv. Still a perv. When he looked at Mary as she was biking 
down the path. He only glanced at her, so he had assumed that she was older, and he was a little bit disappointed to find out she was in fourth grade. Leslie pulled his khaki shorts down to his ankles. He wasn't wearing any underwear, and he exposed his erect penis to Mary, telling her he was going to have sex with her. He was very blunt about it, and you'll soon learn that was how he got off. One way. Having just gone to Sunday school earlier that morning and being a very religious girl, Mary started debating with her kidnapper, arguing that God frowned upon sex before marriage. Leslie told her God was a joke and he didn't believe in any higher power. He even shared with her that as a young boy, a reverend had repeatedly sexually raped him. Oh. He ordered Mary to touch him, and after becoming fully aroused, he grabbed her by the bound wrist, threw the dirty quilt over her shoulder, and he pulled her over to an oak tree. He forced Mary to lie on her back and put her arms over her head. He used this Mickey Mouse swimsuit cover-up from her backpack to bind her wrists, which were already tied, to a tree above her head, and then he raped her. The way she was tied up, caused her wrists to be in a lot of pain during the assault. And the assault itself was very painful. So she started crying. And her crying actually made Leslie stop. He wasn't comfortable abusing such a young girl, especially one like Mary, because in the few minutes they'd conversed, he kind of started to think she was a cool little girl. This is just weird. So he stopped. He wanted to let her go, and he came up with a plan, albeit a really, really stupid one. Tanya, really stupid. In his car was a notebook and a pen. He used that notebook and pen to catalog the activities of dozens of teen girls that he stalked. So he goes to his car. He gets the notebook. He gets the pen. He goes back to Mary, and he unties her. And he tells her she needs to write a letter on the paper stating that she consented to all the sexual activity that she'd had with Leslie. Are you kidding me? Mary's hands were shaking, and being only nine years old, she didn't even know what to write. She tries, though, and he realizes, okay, this isn't going to work. Instead, he ordered Mary to take off her swimsuit again. He forced her to pose in these sexually provocative and demeaning ways, And he took some close-ups of her genitals with a Polaroid camera that he had in his car. Then he made her look at the photos so he could take a picture of her face as she looked at the photo. What the hell? He really got off on the terror in people's eyes. He warned her that if she told anybody about what happened, he would show those pictures to her friends and family. Mary was allowed to put her swimsuit back on. And she was ordered into his beater car. He told her he was going to take her back to the trail where he first encountered her. During this drive, and the drive was less than 10 minutes, he apologized to her for hurting her. And she told him that she forgave him for what he did. He started talking to her about how she needed to not take shortcuts anymore because they were too dangerous and that she needed to pay more attention to her surroundings. So something like what just happened didn't happen again. Giving her advice on how not to be assaulted after he just assaulted her. Finally, he stops the car near the trail and he apologized to Mary one more time, telling her that he just couldn't help himself and that he really hoped She didn't hate him. She assured him that she did not hate him and suggested that he stop doing these things and maybe find himself a woman his own age. (laughs) I love Mary. I know. (laughs) She opened the passenger side door as she was exiting the vehicle. Leslie asked her one more time, you don't hate me, do you? She shook her head no and walked towards her bike that was stashed in the trees off the path. After Leslie left, Mary pedaled her bike home as fast as she could. Oh, no shit, right? She told her parents and the police got called. She helped a sketch artist draw a composite of Leslie. She described him as being in his mid-20s. Light brown wavy hair. He wore a baseball cap, was of average height, and a bit pudgy. But somehow, with all that happened to her, 
and all the trauma she went through, she forgot that he told her his full name. So the police were not aware that it was Leslie Williams. The composite that was developed was distributed everywhere. There were hundreds of flyers posted all over Oakland County. Some tips came in, weeks went by, but there were no solid leads. Authorities knew it was just a matter of time before this predator struck again. And they were right. On September 14th, so it's a month later, and Leslie is on the prowl again. He's a voyeurist, and he spends all of his free time spying on unsuspecting people, usually teen girls. He would often bring his camera and take pictures of them so he could masturbate to them later. September 14th was a Saturday night, and Leslie's lust for rape just became irresistible. As luck would have it, he's driving home from Ann Arbor when he spotted 18-year-old Cami Villanueva walking alone. She's walking on a road and it's dark. It was about 11 p.m. Although Cammie was a bit older than he liked because he liked 16 year olds, she had this really tiny body frame. She was four foot 10 and weighed less than 100 pounds. Oh, she's tiny. Tiny. She was described as a shy high school senior who often sat alone and preferred the company of animals over people. I kind of can't blame her for that one. <laughs> Because people are awful, I so I mean, are. a dog will love you forever, but uh. people not so much. Cammie lived in the small town of South Lyon. Now, you know South Lyon. It's about 45 minutes west of Detroit. It's only a few miles away from where Mary was abducted. The Villa Nueva family lived in the single-story ranch home just outside of town, and Cammie came from a broken family. About seven years earlier, her mother committed suicide Hmm. by intentionally overdosing on drugs and alcohol. Her father, Pedro, he basically tapped out as a dad when Cammie's mom died. Cammie's 21-year-old sister, Trisha, she took over the parenting role. She helped support Cammie by working at the Speedway gas station, about a quarter mile from their home. Sometimes Cammie would come in and she'd earn some money doing odd jobs, working for the manager. And every morning before school, she stopped by there because it was on her way to school. That night, Trisha went to the movies with her boyfriend, Derek, and Cammie was all alone. After dinner, she got bored and she walked uptown where a lot of teens hung out at the parking lot. Okay, yeah. They'd pull up their car, listen to some music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Smoke a doobie. Probably. Around 11 p.m., that's when Cammie decided to head back home. And that's when Leslie spotted her walking on the road. He knew Cammie because he worked at Speedway for a couple months. He parked his car down a side street and he crept up behind the pine trees that shaded her house. Through his binoculars, he could see Cammie playing solitaire alone on the bed. He snuck up the front porch and he wiggled the door handle. He was thrilled when he found out it was unlocked. Lock your doors, people. Lock your doors. Twice. He quietly let himself in. As he headed down the hallway toward her bedroom, Cammie heard the sound of something. She got up from her bed and opened the door, started walking down the hallway when she encountered a man wearing a brown ski mask holding a knife. He warned her she better do what he said or he was going to slice her. The voice sounded so familiar to Cammie, but she couldn't pinpoint how she knew who the guy was. Leslie then grabbed her by the arm. He dragged her through the kitchen, dragged her through the breezeway, and out the back door. She fought him every step of the way, but he was much stronger than her, and everything seemed to happen so fast. Before she could even grasp the entirety of the situation. She was on the floor of Leslie's car, tied up and screaming at the top of her lungs. He started up the car and he started punching Cammie in the face a few times. So she understood that he was in charge of the situation. After driving to a familiar wooded area in the nearby town of Milford, Leslie shut the car off. While Cammie was cowering under the dashboard, Leslie shared with her all the sexual things he planned on doing to her. 
This was part of Leslie's M.O. He'd been practicing for almost 20 years. Because his first rape conviction was in 1973. He would use the most vulgar language he could come up with to describe the forthcoming abuse. He would say things like, are you ready for this, Tanya? I don't even want, I don't even want to say this. I can't even look at you now. (laughs) (laughs) I want to put my meat into you. How do you want me to cream you? How do you want my cream? Ew. Ew. I am so creeped out. And I, I discuss it with myself. And you haven't even told me the worst of the worst, I'm sure. I'm just, he's gross. So those are the things he would say. It's for shock value. Yeah. And for terror. Because he loved to see the terror on his victim's face. That was his foreplay. But Cammie had no intentions of willingly giving in to him. Her strength and her will to survive surprised Leslie. And it really pissed him off. He smacked and he beat on her some more until she finally quieted down. Through the decades, Leslie had developed what he considered a well-entrenched modus operandi. He considered himself to be a relatively nonviolent person. Mm -hmm. He used the term a passive perp to describe himself. But he said when victims fight back, like Cammie, She's guaranteed to be put in the hospital or in the ground. Once Leslie felt this, he had the situation under control, he calmly turned to Cammie and he assured her that when it was all done, he was going to take her back home and it was going to be fine. By doing this, it had a twofold effect. A, it made her less combative. And B, it helped convince Leslie that he wasn't all that bad of a guy. Because you see... His demons were growing darker, and his fantasies were becoming more disturbing, even to him. He often found himself in a trance-like state, lost in the catacombs of perversion that were now marking his soul. In essence, Leslie was trying to assure himself that he wasn't going to cave in to his most evil urges. See, I'm going to let her go. I'm not a bad guy. Right. I'm not so bad. I'm nonviolent. But there would be only one outcome for Cammie. Death. And part of Leslie knew it. He was fighting himself. With Cammie's hands securely tied together and the car parked a safe distance from society, Leslie pulled Cammie out of the car and he walked her around to the trunk. He popped it open, and he's rummaging around looking for the car engine starter fluid because it contained ether. He thought that it would be awesome if he could subdue Cammy because he really wanted a zombie-like victim. While holding on to Cammy with one hand, he tried pouring the ether onto a rag with his other, and Cammy was having no part of this. She managed to wiggle out of his grasp, she pulled it through the woods, but it didn't take long for him to pounce on her and knock her to the ground. He climbed on top of her, and he placed the soaked rag over her mouth to muffle her screams. Her body began convulsing, and then she passed out. He now had the closest thing to a dead girl he could get without actually killing anyone. And this, Tanya, was super arousing. <sighs> I think you can kind of get where I'm going with his dark fantasies. When he finished raping her, he removed his ski mask. He sat on the ground next to her and he smoked a cigarette. As he stared at her naked, unconscious body, he became sexually excited again. But to his surprise, Cammy suddenly woke up. Oh shit, and he doesn't have his mask on. You got it! Oh no. You're good at this stuff. She woke up, she jumped to her feet, and illuminated by the moonlight, she was able to see Leslie's maskless face for the first time. And she immediately recognized him as the guy she thought was super nice at the gas station. He'd always been very outgoing and kind to her. She'd never got the creep factor from him. She screamed his name, and she said, I'm gonna report you to the police. (laughs) I know. Don't say that. Don't say it. You just play the game. Yes, just play the game. But what's really strange is she managed to shift the power play. Leslie began pleading with her not to tell anybody what he did. He even 
offered her $20 from his wallet if she would just get dressed and let him drive her home. It's okay. I'll take that 20 bucks. Let's go. Oh, no. She's on fire. Yeah, she's on fire. She's pissed. I don't blame her. She told him, not a chance in hell are you getting away with what you just did to me. And the two argued for a few minutes, with Leslie growing more and more impatient with the situation. Cammie took off and started running, hoping to get to the road to flag down a car. But once again, Leslie caught up with her and the two struggled. He'd never had someone resist him with such fury. According to Leslie, this sparked a rage inside him he'd never experienced before. But I think that's just a bullshit excuse for why he did what he did next. He grabbed her throat with both hands and he squeezed with all his might until she went limp. He later told authorities, and I quote, You don't know how hard it is to strangle someone to death. He was exhausted. Cammie's lifeless body lay there on the ground in front of him. And guess what? Do not tell me he... No. Of course he did. (sighs) Would it be crimes and consequences if he did not get sexually aroused looking at her body? He knew that sex with a dead body was disgusting. Like, he's not stupid. He knows this is fucking gross. And he tried to minimize the excitement by covering her face with a t-shirt, but it didn't. Finally, he succumbed to his most repulsive pleasure, sexual intercourse with a corpse. As I said, he knew he was a disgusting piece of shit for doing this. And when he was done, he wanted to make sure that no one ever discovered what just happened. He grabbed a small spade shovel from out of his car and used it to dig his shallow grave. He put Cammie's body in it. He took one of her rings as a trophy because mm. they, they like their trophies. Then he threw her clothes on top of her and he covered her with dirt. Then he went home. The next morning, Cammie's sister Trisha filed a missing persons report with Oakland County Sheriff's Department. That same evening, and this is a Sunday, Leslie went to Walmart and he bought two pounds of pepper. Do you know why he bought two pounds of pepper? No. He heard that pepper threw off the scent for tracking dogs. Oh. And prevented animals from digging up the area. Really? I don't think it's based on science, hmm. but that's what he thought. Maybe. Who buys two pounds two of pounds? pepper? Two pounds? I didn't know they sold two pounds of I pepper. Know. With the pepper in the hand... He went to the woods and he visited Cammie's burial spot. He sprinkled two pounds of pepper over the dirt and then do you know what he did? Oh my God, what? He masturbated. Oh Jesus Christ, I knew it! (laughs) On top of the grave. (sighs) Compose ourselves. Authorities conducted aerial, horseback, and ground searches for Cammie and they were under the assumption that maybe she'd committed suicide like her mom. So they were looking for her body, but the searches were fruitless. And they figured that all that searching, if it didn't come up with a body, then she probably didn't commit suicide because she didn't have a car. So she would have been within a few miles. So now they knew she had to have been abducted. But they didn't make the connection between Mary and Cammie because of the age difference and the fact that Mary was just raped and then returned. And the name Leslie Williams never appeared on their list of suspects. But in retrospect, it should have because he spent over half his life in prison for kidnapping and sexual assault of teen girls. He had just been released a year earlier from prison. Looking at Leslie's past, you can see how he progressed from a sweet, blue-eyed, blonde-haired baby boy into a serial killer. And I can't wait to tell you about his parents, Ma and Pa Williams. Oh, this will be good. His parents were Dorothy and Lyle, and they had this comfortable home in the middle-class area of Garden City, Michigan, just south of Detroit. His father worked at the Ford Motor Company, and his mom, she came from an upper-class family. Her father was an executive at Ford. She was used to having very nice things and being privileged. But her choices in men destroyed her life. Leslie was the product of Dorothy's second marriage. Dorothy had gotten married as a teen, and she had two daughters by the time she was 20. But that marriage was marred with domestic violence, and she filed for divorce. 
She married Leslie's father, Lyle, on the same day her divorce was granted. And just a couple months later, gave birth to Lyle Jr. So Leslie's born a year and a half after that. But Dorothy's second marriage to Leslie's dad was worse than her first. Lyle Sr. had a violent and cruel temper. And he was one of those people you never knew what would set him off. There was no rhyme or reason to it. In addition, he was a voyeurist. And he got super excited and turned on by watching his wife fuck other men. Really? He would point out men that he wanted her to sleep with at the bar and tell her to bring them home. And as I said, Dorothy was used to the finer things in life. And she developed a spending habit that she couldn't afford. She tried to sell Tupperware to earn extra money, but when that didn't work, she turned to prostitution instead. The couple got this great idea. There was this bedroom in their basement of the family home. So Lyle cut some peeping holes in the door of it. Dorothy would bring men back to the house, bring them in the basement, charge them $10 for her services, while Lyle watched and masturbated in the closet. But that's not where Lyle's perversion ended. On occasion, he would bring one of his children down into the closet and force them to watch Dorothy have sex. What the hell? While molesting them. (gasps) Oh my God. And of course that happened to Leslie. Lyle was so messed up, he would even bring some of the neighborhood children and put them in the closet and force them to watch Dorothy have sex. Oh my God. And if that wasn't sick enough, he set up a room in the garage. As I said, Dorothy had two daughters from a previous marriage. He would force his young stepdaughters, who were in kindergarten and first grade, to perform oral sex on him in front of the other neighborhood children. What the fuck? Right? When Leslie was four, he witnessed his mother being led out of the house in handcuffs. Because one of Dorothy's Johns was an undercover cop. Whoops. Whoops. Aw, shit. Aw, shit. The police found Lyle hiding in the closet and they arrested him too. I know he ended up being released because they couldn't really hold him on anything. All the children were brought down to the station and they all spent the night in a small room. Leslie's older sisters then told the authorities about their molestation and his father was rearrested on charges of indecent liberties with a child. He was sentenced to four years in the Ionia Mental Hospital for the criminally insane, because back in the 50s, this was like 1959, I guess pedophilia was a mental illness. Dorothy was sentenced to 90 days in jail, and the kids were sent to different boys and girls homes. Leslie's mother was deemed unfit to care for her children, So Leslie and his siblings became wards of the state. During that time, when Leslie was six, he met with a psychologist. He was given a psychology test. And it was one of those you fill in the blanks. The statement was, boys grow up to be men and women grow up to be. And you know what he said? Whores. Punished. Punished. Wow. But a good one. Thank you. Whores is a good one. On two other statements, his answers ended with killing. And he's six. I know. I'm like, oof. That's also the age when Leslie became a chronic masturbator. At six? That's what he says. Oh, I'm so sad for little Leslie. He said that instead of crying or talking or thinking things out, his sole outlet was masturbation. He used that as a form of release. No wonder he grew up to be the man he grew up to be. Right? Right? I mean... Except there's one flaw in that theory. He had an older brother named Lyle. He was 20 months older than him. Lyle went through the same things. And he grew up to become a father, a husband, and a successful business owner and a respected member of the community. Huh. Two brothers, same upbringing, and two completely different paths. Anyway... Eventually, Dorothy regained custody of Leslie and Lyle, and she divorced Leslie's father. She married her third husband, James, in 1962. That marriage was plagued with violence, and she filed for divorce less than a year later. 
But the night before the divorce was set to be finalized, James shot Dorothy in the head, killing her instantly. Wow. And then killed himself. Damn. Leslie was only nine years old when he lost his mother. He was put into uh, another boy's home. And I'm not going to go through everything that happens, but he claims that he was sexually and physically abused. And I bet he was. Most people agree that he was. Obviously, he had a really rough childhood. And just when you're like, oh, poor Leslie, as you were saying, you find out that when he was 14, he molested his eight-year-old cousin. And from then on, his life was a pattern of incarceration, release, crime, incarceration, release, crime. As a senior in high school, that's when he started his own voyeurism. And by the time he was 38 years old, he had perfected his methods. As I said, there were about a dozen teen girls scattered around Oakland and neighboring Livingston County that he would spy on. He'd journal all their activities. For a few weeks, he got off on reliving Cammie's murder, again in his head. But as we know, eventually, a killer is no longer satiated with memories of murder, and they need to strike again. Fifteen days after he killed Cammie, his urges overpowered him again. He grabbed a knife, a shovel, flex cuffs, and ether from his apartment, threw them all in his trunk, and he set out to find his next victim. And he had no delusions about who he was by this point and what he was going to do. Let's take a break. And we're back. I'm going to talk to you about Leslie's second and third kill. 16-year-old Michelle and 14-year-old Melissa Urban were two teen sisters that came from this really loving family in the rural township of Fenton. It's another small town about an hour north of South Lyon. Both the girls were honor roll students who earned money babysitting. They volunteered at a nursing home. Aww. Nice kids. Cute kids. They were only two years apart in age, and they spent all their time together. They weren't just sisters. They were best friends. And everywhere they went, they walked. So Sunday, September 29th, started out like every other Sunday. The girls enjoyed this big family lunch, you know, after church. And when it was done, they asked their mom if they could go for a walk. She made them do the dishes. And then at about 4 p.m., Kathy Urban watched her daughters walk out of the house and down the road that would lead ultimately to their deaths. Like many serial killers, Leslie would cruise around in his car for hours. And he spotted Melissa and Michelle about a week or two earlier while he was driving around. He thought the way 14-year-old Melissa walked was really seductive. And it turned him on. Gross. I'm sure she just walked just like walk- a child child business. Exactly. Child's just walking on the road. He's just a perv. There were at least eight different occasions leading up to this day where he'd watched or followed the girls without them ever knowing. That Sunday, he drove near their house and he was hoping he would see them. And eventually he did. They're walking along this dirt road because Fenton is a rural area and it's got a lot of dirt roads, at least it did back then. And they lived out in the country. So he pulls past them. And he pulls up ahead and he hides his car on an access road. The two girls were in an animated conversation when Leslie jumped out of the bushes, holding the knife. Told him he was going to rob them. And if either one of them tried to run, he'd kill the other one. He ordered them to proceed a few hundred feet until they came to the small clearing. And there's this empty spot. And so he tells the girls, lay face down on the ground and remove your pants and take off your underwear. They were terrified, but they did what he said. He then pulled some flex cuffs from his pocket, and he bound their hands behind their backs. He used packaging tape to cover their mouths, and once he felt he had complete control over the girls, he ordered them to their feet, and he marched them to a ridge that was about 60 feet further into the trees. That's where a silver mercury topaz was hidden. He grabbed a blanket from his car, and he laid it out on the ground, sharing with them his perverse plans of how he intended on raping them. 
He told him he was going to put one in the trunk while he raped the other, and then he was going to switch them out. After crying and crying, he removed the tape from their mouths. Melissa offered herself to him willingly and pledged to do her best to sexually please him in exchange for him not touching her sister, Michelle. Oh. But he said, there's no reason for me to negotiate. I have all the power, and I'm going to do whatever I want to do to both of you. He used some packaging tape to bind Michelle's ankles, and he put her in a kneeling position in the trunk. He told them that if nobody tried to run or do anything funny, he wouldn't close the trunk on Michelle. In reality, he was really excited about the idea of Michelle watching him rape her sister. Of course, because he's gross. Leslie made Melissa perform oral sex on him. It lasted for about 10 minutes, and she did her best to turn him on, which had the opposite effect. He found it extremely unappealing that this 14-year-old girl was trying to act like a seductive woman. That wasn't what he wanted. He later said rape isn't about getting off sexually. An orgasm is just the icing on the cake. It was the terror and the power and the control that he had that got him off. And Melissa putting on this performance that she was enjoying it and trying to please him, that took away from it. He decided he was done with the oral sex. He cut the tape off her ankles and he raped her. Then he grabbed Michelle from the trunk. She was literally shaking physically from terror. He brought her to the blanket and he raped her. He allowed Melissa to kneel next to her while he raped her. And Melissa stroked her hair to comfort her. When his need for power and control was satiated, he got out his Polaroid camera. And just as he did with Mary, he forced the teens to pose sexually, threatening to show that to their friends or family if they contacted the police. The girls were allowed to get dressed, and then he ran out of flex cuffs and packaging tape, so he took these 12-inch leather strips that he had prepared in his car, and he used them to tie up the girls. Then the three sat on a blanket for a few minutes and talked. Leslie put on the charm. He kept trying to ease their mind and tell them that the ordeal would be over soon. So the girls started being a little more at ease. He convinced them that they should inhale a few drops of ether, and then they would go to sleep, and when they woke up, he'd be gone. Michelle held the ether-soaked rag to her mouth, She inhaled it a few times and began to get drowsy. After seeing her reaction, Melissa changed her mind and she refused to put the rag over her face. Leslie knew he could not kill these girls if they were together because they would fight to death for the other one. So he had to figure out how to subdue Melissa who was refusing to do the ether. So he tells Melissa, hey, let's compromise. I'm not going to force you to inhale the ether, but I'm going to separate you two. So that way, it'll buy me more time to get away. Melissa was okay with this idea, and she didn't want to put up a fight either. She believed wholeheartedly that Leslie was going to let him live. Leslie picked up Michelle, who was still groggy from the ether. He carried her over his shoulders, and he walked deeper into the forest. He placed her on the ground, And he went back to Melissa. Melissa was laying on her belly in the blanket, about 60 yards away from her sister. Leslie later said that she had a defeated look on her face, as if the entirety of the situation had finally taken its toll on her. He climbed on her back. He covered her nose and mouth with her t-shirt. She wiggled for a few minutes, but eventually she died. Satisfied she was dead, He went back to Michelle. He tried to suffocate her the same way, and he was surprised about how much of a fight she put up since she seemed so meek in the beginning. This suffocation he was trying to do didn't work, so he had to grab her head, and he kept twisting it and twisting it, and then he snapped her neck. Then he had sex with her dead body because he's disgusting. Using a shovel he brought with him, he tried to dig some graves when he was all done but there's too many tree roots. 
So instead, he put the girls in a trunk and he drove them to this Oakwood cemetery about five miles away. Leslie had a thing for cemeteries. Of course he does. <laughs> I'm not surprised. He spent a lot of time there. And I was reading about it. It was actually part of his attraction to the dead. At the cemetery, Leslie wrapped the girls in a blanket. He dug a hole and he covered them with dirt. Leslie didn't strike again for almost four months. But then that urge, you know, it got too much for him. And after New Year's, he needed a new victim. And he found one with 15-year-old Cindy Marie Jones. She was a junior varsity cheerleader at Milford High School in Michigan. And she's just a great girl. She worked part-time at McDonald's. She was part of Students Against Drunk Driving. She helped her single mother, Alana, out by taking care of her three younger brothers and sisters. For the last six months, Cindy had been dating a really nice guy. His name was Luke. He was 16. He was a football star, and she would cheer him on as a cheerleader. Cute. And then they went to church together on Sundays. Oh, that's even more adorable. Isn't that cute? Yes. On January 4th, it was a Saturday night, Luke came over to Cindy's house to watch the Terminator with her. She was babysitting her younger siblings while her mom did some errands. When her mom got back, Cindy asked if she could go to McDonald's with Luke and grab some Cokes. They went through the drive through they brought two pops, and then the teens drove to Milford Central Park, just down the road. Luke pulled in the parking lot, and the teens sat there for a few minutes. Unbeknownst to them, Leslie had been out there at the park for over an hour, freezing his balls off. And I'm assuming... He's freezing because it's January 4th. Sitting outside of Michigan on January 4th is got to be cold. It's got to be. No doubt. When they pulled in, he watched them, and he knew Cindy would be the perfect victim. There was no one else at the park, so he was ready to strike. Using the trees to shadow him, he snuck up to Luke's car, and then he quickly opened the driver's side door. He had this brown ski mask, and he's brandishing a knife. He instructed Luke to scoot over And then Leslie hopped in the car with a very terrified couple. They were completely caught off guard. He told them in a calm and convincing voice that he just robbed a store and he he just wanted Luke's car to get away. He, of course, got out some flex cuffs and he bound their hands and he ordered Luke to go in the backseat. He tells the teens he's going to go tie them up together around a small tree and he's just going to leave them there. And as scary as that may sound, it brought comfort to them. Because no matter what happened, at least they're together. He orders them out of car and he marches them through the snowy field into their surrounding woods. While they're walking, he occasionally pokes Luke with this knife that he's got to his back to remind Luke, hey, I've got a knife. Luke was six foot three and he was athletic. And Leslie was five foot nine chain smoked and he was overweight so leslie knew if luke tried he could overpower leslie so by poking him with a knife he wanted to remind luke that don't try any shit you got it as they approached this wire fence this old fence leslie made the couple kneel beside each other in the snow he told them that he was going to tie luke to the small tree first and then he would use flex cuffs to tie cindy to luke Luke was forced to sit in the snow with his back against a tree, and Leslie used a really long flex cuff. It was 27 inches, and he secured Luke through his bound wrist to the small tree. When he was satisfied that Luke was secure, he grabbed Cindy and he pulled her up to her feet, and he turned to her and he said, come with me. Cindy says, whoa, 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 wait, you promised to keep us together. And his once trusting voice sounded different now. Very flatly, he said, I lied. Luke just sat and stared helplessly as he watched Cindy being marched off into the darkness on that cold January night. It was only a minute later that Luke was able to break free of the plastic ties that bound him to the tree. He ran through the park and he was screaming out Cindy's name. 
he got in his car and he started driving because he was convinced that Cindy was walking with this guy. He was just so confused. But eventually he flagged down a couple and they called the police. By the time the police began questioning Luke, Cindy was already at Leslie's apartment. Oh, no. Yeah. It's in Redford. Ah. Yeah, you know Redford. She tried to make conversation with him, but he was not interested in discussing his personal life at all. He only wanted to talk about the rape he was going to do and the humiliation that was about ready to take place. He told her, I'm going to fuck you no matter what, so you might as well sit back, relax, and try to enjoy it. He told her he's sorry that she was going through what she was going through, but he had his own needs. That's what he said to her. He spent the next few hours raping and abusing her, doing every sick thing you can think of. He forced her to stand seductively by his bedroom door, and he took some nude photos of her. Then he positioned her on the bed and took some close-up photos of her private areas. But eventually, Leslie grew tired of the whole situation, and he told Cindy he was going to take her back to where he dropped her off. He threw her clothes at her and he said, get dressed. They both walked to the car in the parking lot and they got into it and he bound her hands behind her back. He got on the highway and he got off on the Milford exit, which really excited Cindy. She thought, okay, I'm going home. He pulled into these woods that were familiar to him and they were near some railroad tracks and he stopped the car and he said, okay, Cindy, listen, you're going to get out and you're just going to have to walk home from here. Her hands, as I said, were bound behind her back. So he opened the passenger side of the car and he pulled her out. And according to Leslie, on impulse, without even thinking about it, he plunged the knife into her chest. Cindy started screaming, but died pretty quickly. Prior to placing her in her final resting spot, he pulled her pants down and he had sex with her body. When he was done, he rolled her into a grave and he left. And just so you know, he would periodically come back and visit these graves. Would he? And talk to them. He would talk to them. Yes, he would. He should have been on the police radar. And there's some cases that I didn't want to add in here because this is a long episode already. But as months went by, Leslie continued stalking and raping women. So he let them go? Yes, he let some go. Oh, which is why there's a lull in the murders. Mm-hmm. Eight months went by with him never even being considered a suspect. So he felt invincible. But on May 24th, a chain of events ultimately brought the case of serial killer Leslie Ann Williams to fruition. It was the day before Memorial Day, and 35-year-old Carla Walters went to Hillview Memorial Center to put some flowers on her mom's grave. From the corner of her eye, she saw Leslie, but she didn't think anything of it. Leslie says he was there, quote, raking through the confusion he felt over his need to kill and the knowledge of how wrong it was. And probably about why he likes dead women. He was speaking to the tombstones as a way to calm himself when he spotted Carla. He walked over to her and he began talking to her in a flirtatious manner. Really? She's putting flowers on her (laughs) mom's grave. Really? Don't hit on her. Read the room, man. God. She made it clear to him that she was not interested in striking up a conversation at her mom's grave. And she turned away. Leslie later said, quote, to me, the way she seemed to cut me short I took it as a snub, rejection, an insult. And I got angry just like that. Well, yeah, she rejected you. She's at her mom's grave, probably crying. (laughs) He's just so stupid. He's so stupid. (laughs) Leslie pulled out a gun. And this was a gun he'd stolen weeks earlier from a house of two teen sisters that he'd been stalking. The gun was empty, but Carla, she didn't know that. He pointed the gun to her head, and he instructed her to walk to his car, which was parked a few yards away. As they made their way to the car, she asked, like, why me? She literally said, I'm 35 years old. What do you want with me? And he point blank told her, I'm going to fuck you. She tried to reason with him, but it was futile. 
So she started kicking him and poking at his eyes. <laughs> Leslie pushed her onto the floorboards and he hit her head over and over again, at least four times with the butt of the gun. Dazed, she could feel the blood dripping down her face. Then he must have changed his plans because he pulled her from the car and he dragged her face down by the wrist towards the woods that lined the cemetery. She's trying to grab these bushes and trees, anything she could touch along the way. But Leslie's pull was too strong. He stopped and he started rubbing her face into the dirt and leaves. And then he jumped on her back. She begged him not to kill her, but he put his hands around her throat. And then Carla started fading in and out of consciousness. The next thing she recalls is she hears her assailant in a firm voice say, Please leave us alone. We're trying to have sex. A man named Carl Paulson Jr. Sorry, we have Carl and Carla, so you got to follow me on this. He didn't know what to make of what he was witnessing at the edge of the cemetery. (laughs) He had just brought his elderly mom, Helen, to Hillview Memorial to place some flowers on his dad's grave. Oh my goodness. But there was this small gray Taurus and the passenger side door was open and it blocked their way. So he honked his horn, but he didn't get a response. So Carl got out of the car. And as he stepped out of the car and walked towards the tourists, he spotted Leslie and Carla in his peripheral vision. And he started walking to them, yelling out, hey, dude, can you move your car? And that's when Leslie said they were trying to have sex. They're just trying to have sex here on the edge of the cemetery. I know. Really? It's so crazy. it's like fucking broad daylight? Yes. Yeah, Okay. Carl went back to his mother, who was sitting in the vehicle, and he told her, something is not right here. Carl's with his elderly mom, and they decide they're just going to have to walk to his father's grave to put the flowers on it. So they do. And as they're walking, and they get to the grave, Carl could see Leslie. Again, through his peripheral vision. He was going through the motions of sex, but the woman didn't seem to be moving at all. And she wasn't making any sounds either. He and his mom decided they probably needed to get the hell out of there. Yeah, and get get the police. So as best they could, they tried to feign normalcy and casually walk back to the car. Not far down the road, they spotted this patrol car. And the officer was at the scene of a small accident. So Carl goes up to this deputy. His name is Deputy Anderson. And he says, I think there might be a crime taking place at the cemetery. And I really, really, really want you to come and check it out. Deputy Anderson took him very seriously and he called for backup. Then he followed Carl and Helen back to Hillview Memorial. And I just love that there's this 87 year old woman in the car. <laughs> but <laughs> putting flowers on her poor husband's grave, watching somebody have sex with somebody else. I mean, can you imagine? No. No, I think by the time I'm 87, I'll be like, eh, yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised these kids these days. (laughs) By the time they got there, Leslie was behind the wheel of his Ford Taurus, and he was trying to exit the cemetery. The woman that Carl had seen earlier, she wasn't there. She wasn't in the car. Deputy Anderson and Carl, along with his mom, they tried to block the cemetery's exit with their cars, but Leslie just drove over all the graves and went to the main road. Oh my God. So Deputy Anderson spun his car around and chased him in hot pursuit for two miles. It ended after Leslie tried to make a right turn too fast and his car went airborne and landed in a culvert. Leslie jumped out of the car and he started to run, but Deputy Anderson pulled out his gun and told him to stop or I'll shoot. So Leslie stops. As the deputy's placing cuffs around Leslie's wrists, Leslie turns to the cop and says, quote, I have a woman in my trunk with a flex cuff around her neck. You need to get her out of there or she's going to die. Oh. That's a direct quote. The deputy pulled the keys out of Leslie's ignition and he used them to pop the trunk. Inside lay Carla with a 27-inch flex cuff around her neck, gasping and gurgling. She was unconscious. Deputy Anderson took out his knife and he cut the flex tie. Carla regained consciousness within a few seconds. And when she looked around, she was in the trunk of a car with a shovel intended 
for her burial right next to her. Dang. After Leslie was arrested, they searched his car and his apartment. And they searched him. In his wallet were two photographs of Cindy's vaginal and rectal areas. Mm, Gross. They also found a piece of paper on him. And it contained the details of all of his victims for the past 22 months. He put their age, whether or not they were virgins. Oh my God, Tanya. He put the color of the hair around their rectum. Stop it. On it. Like, why? What a why? fucking sicko. And whether or not they were alive. Wow. There were four victims on this list that he had raped but not killed. And for one reason or another, they never contacted authorities. I know one was a jogger, and I don't know much about the other ones. Eventually, Leslie pled guilty to four counts of murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison. He's currently held in a medium security prison in Carson City, Michigan. Leslie has been very vocal as to what he thinks made him the way he is. He confesses, he wrote a five-page confession, and he discusses all the other rapes and assaults throughout his life because he was in prison for so much of it. He did so much psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. And one of his psychotherapists, his name is William McDonald, he was asked by the Detroit Free Press to discuss some of his methods he had used on Leslie, which obviously did not work. He wouldn't go into specifics, but he said, quote, the whole field of psychotherapy is just basically a dance with demons. There's so much craziness and so much pain and so much crazy response to the craziness and the pain. End quote. All right. All right. (laughs) Just Mm. a dance with demons. Just dance with demons. So anyway, that is the story of Leslie Williams. Gross. Gross. Another gross one. Thanks for that. (laughs) Yeah, really. Thanks for that, Talia. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. If you would like to become a member and get all of the awesome perks, go to our website, tntcrimes.com, or go to patreon.com slash tntcrimes and find out how to do that. You can also find us on social media, yep. Instagram and Facebook, at Hardcore True Crime. And thank you all for the awesome reviews, by the way. Yes, we'll be doing Review the Reviewer again yes. soon. <laughs> So until next week, don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.